Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar for the pre application webinar for RFA CA 2038 and RFA CA 2039 for the CeroNet. Um, we'll give folks just a moment to join, but as, uh, as you join, please note that everybody will be muted at all times during the webinar. And please keep your camera off, it helps with bandwidth. Um, and this meeting will be recorded and posted on the NCI website at a later date. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so you can submit your questions uh, during the webinar at any time using the chat feature. Uh, you can chat with either everyone or with myself, Samantha Finstad, moderator. Um, you may uh, need to find the chat box depending on your view. It will either be on your lower right-hand side, or if you are watching this webinar in full view, you, you need, will need to hover over the screen and you will see a, um, a chat bubble pop up where you can ask the chat. Um, I will ask questions on your behalf during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, this is the reapplication webinar for the Serological Sciences Network for RFA CA 20 and 38 and RFA CA 2039. Next slide, please. So uh, Dr. Julie Clem will be presenting uh, on behalf of the CeroNet. Also on the call are Crystal Wolfrey from the Office of Grants Administration and Dr. Eric Stemme from uh, NIAID and myself, Samantha Finstad, also from the NCI. All right, Julie, all you. Thanks very much, Samantha. Uh, thanks everyone for joining this pre-application webinar today. In today's webinar, I'll give an overview of the serological sciences networks of which these RFAs are a part. And then I will spend time uh, reviewing the request for application details for both the U54 and U01 RFAs. And at the end, we will take your questions using the procedure that Samantha just outlined. Um, please note regarding the questions that questions about specific pro project proposals will not be addressed today in this webinar. The U54 and U01 RFAs will be part of a serological sciences network that we are calling CeroNet for short. I'm going to start by giving you an overview of this network. NCI is establishing the Serological Sciences Network in response to the Supplemental Funding Act from Congress that was enacted at the end of April this year. This appropriated $306 million to NCI to develop, validate, improve, and implement serological testing and associated technologies. In response to this charge, the NCI, in collaboration with NAID, is establishing a serological sciences network. This network is going to be comprised of the following components. Four to eight serological sciences capacity building centers, four to eight U54 centers of excellence, five to 10 serological sciences research projects. These will be coordinated out of the Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research, which runs the FNL Serology Laboratory. The FNL will serve as the overall coordinator of the network. All of the components of the network are expected to collaborate, sharing data, uh, results, and reagents. And I'll talk about each component in more detail on the next slides. The FNL Serology Lab is currently serving a critical function, working with the FDA to qualify serological assays for emergency use authorization. Within CeroNet, the FNL Serology Laboratory will implement and qualify SARS-CoV-2 assays. They'll develop qualified assay standards and generate novel reagents. They'll procure and characterize serum samples from SARS-CoV-2 patients and controls and establish serum panels. And they will share ass these assays, reagents, and standards within the, the CeroNet. The Serological Sciences Capacity Building Centers will also be a critical component of the CeroNet. The purposes of these centers is to develop and expand serological testing capacity and practice in the community. 
They will, they will conduct serological standardization and assay development, and they will scale up to screening capacity with FDA EUA assays up to, up to 10,000 patients per week. We will not be discussing this RFP in any detail on today's webinar, uh, but for those of you who are interested, please contact the email shown on the screen uh, to receive the RFP, which was just published this week on June 16th. The receipt date for responses to this RFP is July 16th. Today's webinar focuses on the two grant funded components the U54 Centers of Excellence and the U01 Research Project. Both are aimed at supporting fundamental science to understand the serological, humoral, and cellular immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 viral infection to inform the development of no novel serological tests. Structurally, the U54s are multi-component centers, and they're comprised of two to three research projects with a unifying theme, an administrative core, and an optional shared resource core. The UO1s are single projects that are supporting research in the SARS-CoV-2 serological sciences. Finally, and very importantly, the SeroNet will be coordinated by a network coordinating center that will be run by the Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research. This coordinating center will work closely with the NIH and with SeroNet staff and investigators to manage all aspects of the SeroNet coordination. And this will include organizing SeroNet steering committee and investigator meetings. Uh, they will manage network communication and outreach. The coordinating center will uh, facilitate reagent sharing and distribution, and they will facilitate and coordinate network data management. With that context, I'll now talk in more detail about the SeroNet U54 and U01 RFAs. The overall goal of these RFAs is to support basic and applied serological research to characterize the immune response elicited by SARS-CoV-2 viral infection. Both the U54 and the U01 share a common set of scientific goals, and these were developed um, uh, and highly informed through the request for information that was released by NCI and NIAID in late May and early June. Um, these, uh, at a high level, these goals are to identify and advance research opportunities to characterize the immune response elicited by SARS-CoV-2 viral infection, to understand the mechanisms driving the serological, humoral, and cellular immune responses, to determine the host, genetic, and environmental modifiers of the immune response, to determine the serological correlates of disease pathogenesis and protection against future infection, and also to define access, communication, and implementation barriers related to SARS-CoV-2 serological testing. A breadth of scientific approaches are appropriate to support these goals. And I'll review several examples, areas of investigation on the following slides. These examples include developing novel assays and preclinical and computational model systems to test the adaptive and innate immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Also, understanding the mechanisms underlying the innate, cell-mediated, and humoral immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 including macrophage activating syndrome and cytokine storm, as well as how disease severity differs as a function of immune health status. We're interested in determining if therapeutics and passive antibody therapies used to treat COVID-19 modulate the serologic and immune responses to SARS-CoV-2. Also, characterizing the serologic differences resulting from natural infection versus vaccination against SARS-CoV-2 and how they correlate with the persistence or longevity of the response. We're interested in identifying genetic and epigenetic determinants that modulate the development and durability of immune responses against SARS-CoV-2 infection. Also, understanding what factors affect the SARS-CoV-2 immune response or pathogenesis and understanding how precancerous conditions, cancer, and or cancer therapeutics affect 
the serologic and immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection and the clinical course of infection, and conversely, how the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 affects precancerous conditions, cancers, and response to cancer therapies. We all, we're also interested in several categories of epidemiology and population sciences studies. Examples include understanding how patient demographic factors behavioral and environmental factors affect immune or serological response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Also researching the clinical and public health implementation of validated serologic assays, their interpretation and follow-up for health outcomes. Also approaches to promoting and ensuring equitable access to serologic testing and whether differential access further exacerbates health disparities. And finally, determining the ethical, legal, and social implications of serologic testing for SARS-CoV-2 in diverse populations and the best methods for appropriate communication of results and interpretation. Out of scope for these uh, RFAs include interventional trials of vaccines and other therapeutics. Fundamental virology studies are also out of scope for these RFAs. And finally, studies involving the long-term impact of SARS-CoV-2 infection on comorbidities unrelated to cancer or precancers are out of scope for these RFAs. Both RFAs are clinical trials optional. And while therapeutic trials are out of scope for these RFAs, interventional trials addressing behavioral, healthcare delivery, or implementation research related to serologic testing and serologic outcomes are appropriate for this RFA. These research efforts should include a broad and diverse population, um, including considerations of age, sex, gender, race, socioeconomic status, rural populations, ethnicity, as well as specific vulnerable populations. And leveraging ongoing cohort studies and registry data is encouraged with these studies. Um, if a clinical trial is proposed, it's important to understand the NIH requirements for clinical trials research, which were updated in January 2018. It's important that you learn about and understand the policies. And that includes understanding that application, the application form now consolidates all human subjects and clinical trial related information into one place and also expands the information required uh, for these applications that include a clinical trial. Please note that investigators and staff must also receive training in good clinical practice, and that all sites participating in multi-site studies need to use a single IRB. Um, finally, as a reminder, all NIH-funded clinical trials are expected to register and submit results to clinicaltrials.gov. So be sure to review the information about the NIH clinical trials requirements on the NIH website. So next, I'm going to go through the application requirements for the U54 Centers of Excellence. For those of you who might not be familiar with the U54 mechanism, it's a, it's a cooperative agreement that's intended to support uh, any part of a full range of research and development from very basic to clinical. And the spectrum of activities is intended to comprise a multidisciplinary attack on a specific disease or biological problem area. And as a clinical trial, uh, it will receive continuous attention from NIH staff. The budget for, for the Serological Sciences U54 is 1.5 million direct costs per year per center over a project period of five years. Non-domestic entities are not eligible to apply, although foreign components are allowed. Uh, next, I'll walk through the components of the U54 centers. So each center must have an administrative core that manages and coordinates all of the center research and activities and serves as a liaison between the center and the other components of Seronet. Each center should include two, at least two, and up to three research projects that closely integrate into the organizing framework of the center 
and that together constitute a multifaceted approach to the serological response to SARS-CoV-2. The center may optionally include uh, one to two shared resource cores that should provide technical, experimental, or computational expertise that's essential to more than one research project within the center. To support this structure, the U54 application requires the following components. The overall component is where you describe the vision and goals of the center, with, and the research strategy portion of the overall component is limited to 12 pages. There's an, uh, the administrative core component has a research strategy uh, page limit of three. The optional shared resource core sections has a research strategy page limit of three. And the, the two to three research projects should have research strategies of up to six pages. So please note, this is an emergency funding opportunity due to the SARS-CoV-2 global pandemic. And therefore, applicants do not need to provide extensive background information or preliminary data in this application. And this is why the page limits are restricted as they are. It is critical that the applicants follow the multi-project multi instructions in the SF-424 application guide. Please be sure to read these carefully as you prepare your application. Um, now I'll describe each of these components in more detail, starting with the overall component. So the overall component in the U54 will describe the vision and goals of the center. The research strategy should describe the fundamental questions that will be addressed by the research center and how they integrate to form an overall research theme. In addition to the research theme, the research strategy should describe the center organization. It should also explicitly discuss the integration of the work proposed and the cross-cutting elements. Um, it's important to demonstrate that the use of the research center mechanism is essential to accomplishing the studies uh, that would not occur without the climate facilities and research resources that a center can uniquely provide. Also describe, also describe in the research strategy uh, how the center will include the necessary expertise and support the team science environment needed to conduct the proposed research. Also in the overall component, you should briefly describe each research project, including its scientific integration within the organizing framework and finally, briefly describe any shared resource cores, including how they will support the research projects. The overall component includes the resource sharing plan for the entire center. This plan must address the, the following components. Um, the processes for making primary data and resulting publications immediately and broadly available to the public approaches for making protocols, standard operating procedures, and computational tools and other software broadly available. The resource sharing plans could address the sharing of data within the center, across the network, and with the broader research community. Finally, if a cl clinical trial is planned, it must address participant study consents and include wherever possible the option to use data and biospecimens for future research studies. The next section of the application is, is the administrative core. The research strategy section of the administrative core doesn't use the standard subsections. Instead, please include the following, a management and communication plan that describes the leadership and communication strategies to manage and track process of the multiple projects and sites that make up off the center. Um, a section about Seronet meetings and other network activities that should include a brief description of strategies for connecting and integrating the center with the broader activities of Seronet. And finally, a section around center and program evaluation and how the administrative core will coordinate participation in center program evaluation activities. This includes activities such as progress reports, site visits, and providing additional communication and materials to the NIH. A few notes about the budget for the administrative core. In addition to the PI and other personnel of the administrative core, 
You're strongly encouraged to budget for a center administrator who will manage the day-to-day -day operations of the center. The administrative course should also include the travel funds for the center and should include funds to support travel for network activities, including participation in Serenet investigator. Finally, in the administrative core budget, you must account for funds to support trans-network projects. Beginning in your budget period two, the applicant, applicants must allocate 10% of their annual budget within the direct cost cap to a restricted fund that will support collaborative activities with other components of the CeroNet. Final decisions for release of these set-aside funds will be made by NIH staff based on recommendations from the CeroNet steering committee. And that would be, that, those are activities that will happen post-award. If the application includes one or more shared resource cores, please note the following. Uh, a reminder that each shared resource core is expected to support at least two research projects. And in the research strategy section, please address the value of the core services to the research center and the research projects, the interaction between the resource core and the research projects, procedures for how the core will prioritize services to the proposed projects in the U54, and as appropriate, any quality control measures used by the shared resource core. Be sure to note that these, these proposed new shared resources must not duplicate analogous resources already established in the applicant institutions, but supplemental funding to such existing resources may be requested. Finally, each research project in the center should include a research strategy <clears throat> that clearly describes the SARS-CoV-2 serological science research addressed by each project. Be sure to explain how the proposed research will accelerate understanding of the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 and inform the development of novel serological tests to further define the characteristics of COVID-19. <clears throat> and if applicable, describe how the shared resources will be used for the proposed research. Next, I'll describe the application details for the U01 RFA. Relative to the U54, the structure of the U01 research projects is more straightforward. Um, U01s are intended to support discrete specified projects to be form, performed by the named investigators in an area representing his or her scientific interest. And again, as a cooperative agreement, it's expected to receive continuous attention from the funding institute and division staff. The budget for the U01 is 500K direct costs per year for a project period of five years. Like the U54, non-domestic entities are not eligible to apply, although foreign components are allowed. <clears throat> the research strategy is limited to six pages. And as with the U54, please note that applicants do not need to provide extensive background information or preliminary data in this application. The research strategy should clearly describe the SARS-CoV-2 serological sciences research addressed by each project, explaining how the proposed research will accelerate understanding of the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 and inform the development of novel serological tests to define the characteristics of COVID-19. Regarding the budget for the U01, as with the U54, applicants should budget uh, for travel to network activities and, and should also uh, set aside funds to support trans network projects. Again, beginning in budget period two, applicants must allocate 10% of their actual annual budget to a restricted fund to support collaborative activities with other components of the zero net. U01 must also provide a research sharing plan that has the same requirements that I described for the U54. <clears throat> Finally, I'll review aspects of the RFAs that are common to both the U54 and the U01. As I've mentioned, both RFAs are cooperative agreements. And in section six of the RFAs, lists specific cooperative terms and agreements of the award. 
that outline specific, specific terms of the award and define and describe the responsibilities of the awardee and NIH staff. Please be sure to read these carefully and I'll highlight some of the key elements here. Um, awardees are expected to participate in a cooperative, interactive, and collaborative manner with the other participants in CeroNet in order to maximize the impact of the network and to meet program goals and objectives. Uh, one PI from each CeroNet U01 and U54 award, as well as from the other components of the CeroNet, will comprise a CeroNet steering committee. This committee will establish guidelines and agreements with regard to network specific scientific, strategic, and administrative issues. Awardees are also expected to participate in additional collaborative research act activities identified post award by the CeroNet Steering Committee. These are activities that would be supported through the budget set asides I described. Awardees are also expected to adhere to net a network communication plan, which will be drafted by the CeroNet Steer Steering Committee post award. Applications to these RFAs will be reviewed by a special emphasis panel convened by the NCI. The reviewers will be reminded again that preliminary data are not required. And accordingly, the reviewers will be asked to emphasize the conceptual framework, the level of innovation, and the potential to significantly advance our knowledge or understanding. Um, and appropriate justification for the pr proposed work can be provided through literature, literature citations, data from other sources, or when available from investigator-generated data. Applications with a cancer component will be given preference. I encourage you to, very, to carefully review the FOA-specific review criteria in each of the RFAs. So to summarize the distinction between the U01 and the U54 RFAs, the key distinctions are the budget level, the number of awards anticipated, the number of distinct research projects, the requirement for an administrative core, and the option to establish uh, one to two shared resource cores. Both the U01 and the U54 have the same requirements for a resource sharing plan. They have the same cooperative agreement terms and conditions. The requirement to set aside budget for collaborations proposed post-award, participation in the CERNET steering committee, and review by an NCI convened special emphasis review panel. To review the key dates for these RFAs, of course, today is the pre-application webinar. The application due dates for both RFAs is July 22nd. The applications were, will be reviewed in August, and we expect uh, awards to be made in mid to late September of this year. Finally, I want to remind everyone to please read the FOAs very carefully as you prepare your applications. Uh, today's webinar and slides will be posted on the CERNET webpage soon after uh, today's meeting. As I mentioned, questions specific to your proposal cannot be addressed in today's webinar, but we encourage you to reach out to any of the scientific contacts uh, listed in the RFAs. That's myself, Samantha Finstad, or Eric Stemme. Finally, uh, for those of you who may be interested in the request for proposals to, for the capacity building centers, we encourage you to please send a request to the email uh, listed here. And again, the, 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 the proposal redue date, due dates for that RFP are July 16th. For those of you who may have research interests that are beyond the scope of the serological sciences RFAs, I do want to note that NIAID has a current set of funding opportunities um, that address uh, research related to the SARS-CoV-2 virus outside the scope of these RFAs. Uh, information about those funding opportunities are shown on this slide and are available on the NIH website. Um, with that, we now would like to turn to the question and answer portion of the webinar. Uh, 